We're popping up in Florida with an all-new BizBash experience. Join us February 19th and 20th at the Gaylord Palm Resort and Convention Center in Kissimmee as we co-locate with Connect. Hear from President Barack Obama, Ambassador Capricia Marshall, former Social Secretary Disha Dyer, Disney's former Head of Innovation and Creativity Duncan Wardle, and more. Register now at bizbashlive.com forward slash Florida. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor-in-Chief Beth Kormanick. Hi, David. Hey, Beth. Here we are, another edition of Gather Geeks. Our guest today is Mark Friedland, the owner of Mark Friedland Couture Communications in Los Angeles. He started out in the industry by creating hand-painted greeting cards and now provides a variety of services that include event concepts, event branding, gifting and keepsakes, and of course, invitations for corporate, nonprofit, and social events. Anyone who has watched the Academy Awards recently has seen his work. In 2011, he started creating the Oscar envelopes, making them a signature part of the event The one year he did not design the envelopes, by the way, in 2017, was when the presenters infamously announced the wrong winner for Best Picture. Uh, We spoke with him after that for tips on creating effective award envelopes. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, But the conversation here is going beyond envelopes. Mark (laughs) is, is, he's certainly well known in LA and beyond, and his clients have included the likes of Oprah Winfrey, Brad Pitt, Jennifer Aniston, uh, excuse me. Jennifer Lopez, uh, that's quite a slip, Uh, Tyler Perry, UNICEF Swarovski, and the New York Public Library. David, what did you want to tease out about how Mark sees the world? Well, it is very interesting. He has taken his greeting card business when he first started and converted it to multi-million dollar 60th birthday parties for people uh, and doing surprise parties for other celebrities, which you'll hear about. And uh, he has taken everything to a whole new level. And I thought it was interesting to sort of hear how he thinks about experiences and how he realizes that he's really taking them to the, to the next level. It's a lot of fun. Let's listen. It's a lot of fun. So, Mark, we've known each other a long time. Yes. I'm here in uh, Los Angeles at uh, World Headquarters. <laughs> Welcome to the studio. <laughs> Welcome to this. We love being here. At almost every event I go to now and every speech I give, my Angelou seems to come up. Mm-hmm. And you seem to be epitomizing that with what you're doing now. Why don't you explain what you're up to and how you've become such an expert to become a Maya Angelou uh, aficionado, or I don't even know what you'd call it. I I asked her to come up with a quote to define my business, and this is what she said. I'm joking there. But she said, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that, in the most simplest way, defines what our business has been about for 33 years. And the business has evolved a lot. You started out in the invitation world. Greeting cards. The greeting card hand-painted world. Hand-painted greeting cards. The hand-painted greeting cards. You were trying to get that emotion back then. Absolutely. And when it was a hand-painted card, it, the individuality came forth. The thoughtfulness came forth. And we were really in the business of thoughtfulness and how to kind of express that, even in its most simplest ways. One of the original cards 33 years ago was an Alka-Seltzer packet and just said, thanks for dinner. So it brought up an emotion in people, brought up joy, it brought up uh, tactile. That's always been part of what's been a secret sauce of what we've done, using interesting materials. So it, it kind of made these imprints on people's emotional um, states that they've always remembered. And this was even before all the new digital... We were talking earlier about Letraset. Uh, yes. I mean, I used to type the sentiments on a typewriter, cut them out, and glue them in with the rubber cement. And then I would go store to store selling them. And that's how it all started. And then somebody bought one of the cards and said, could you make an invitation out of this? And that's how it... it, it so it's always been a progression every step of the way, even now 33 years later. And so 33 years later now, you're basically taking 
taking that same thing and creating an entire experience. That's exactly right. You just basically took the greeting card and made it into a multi-million dollar event. Exactly. And it's a a mixed media event. It touches the senses on so many different levels. And I think what really kind of helps define what we do, it it involves storytelling, it involves the senses, it involves a certain sensibility, you know, a little wacky sensibility sometimes, style, social graces, all of those are the components that create a memorable experience. Okay, so this memorable experience that we that you told me about that yes. said, come to Los Angeles, we have to talk yes, about this. Yes. Give me uh, a little, give everybody who's listening a sense of what that experience was, what this greeting card that these people decided <laughs> to give to their friends and their friends to this couple of this person. So in many respects, it feels like a 30-year opus because when the client first came to me, and I worked with her before, and it was a 60th surprise party for her husband's um, birthday. It was joy in every part of it. So it wasn't like the client saying, don't spend money. And Well, there were parts of that, but until we kind of got, I got her to understand that this was about inviting joy and that this was, she obviously loves her husband very much. He's well-loved by all of his friends. And she wanted to create an experience that for the family and friends who adore him, they will never forget as a, as a kind of a gift to 160 people. I feel very strongly about that, that those who are able to do this, to be able to bring joy in the world right now, I think is a very important aspect. So it's not about the money that's being spent. It's about the, I, I, I called the ROI ROJ, return on joy, you know? That's a new one. I I don't know if it's going to make it to Harvard Business. So tell us what this experience was. The bigger picture first and then go into the details. So let me just backtrack for one second because what it started as, she came to me and she said, we did this thing for his 50th. It was so fantastic. He loves Havana. He loves cigars. Why don't we just repeat that same party again, right? And so I said, you know what, Christina? I said, I just can't do another theme party. That's, we can do better than that. And we can create something that is so unique, that is so individualized, so personalized to Tim that it can't be repeated, basically. So we started talking. It was surreal that he was talking, turning 60. And somehow we, we landed on the fact that they owned a, a Dolly painting. And right then, the light bulb went off, and let's just call it Surreal at 60, inspired by Salvador Dali. Did you see the Dali at the home? or did you? I never saw it. To- no, because when I was trying to extract from her, and a lot of the work that I do is a little bit therapist, it's a little bit of fact-finding, and it was really trying to get that core essence of what defined Tim. And it was hard because she said, well, he likes boxing. He likes cigars. But there was no there there until we landed on that. But it looks like it could have ended up being a bro party. It, it could have been whatever. <laughs> but, but, you know, and again, I just don't believe in doing events or parties that don't have a sense of purpose, that don't have a sense of personalized distinction. These are almost living, breathing works of performance art done as an event in a way. You know? so, okay, so take us through. What was the... What was the scene? So uh, the scene was, so the first thing was locking down that, that concept. Then it went to, Dolly had done a cookbook for his wife that he illustrated. And it's a crazy cookbook. And so the, the, the real hero of the event, and we kind of came up with it in three acts. There was the arrivals and cocktails, there was the dinner, and then there was the after party, which is somewhat typical in a lot of events. So we started with the dinner first as the hero, and we knew we wanted to do a surrealist dinner. So I then started brainstorming on what that could be. I love the idea of just two long tables, 80 guests each. We had an amazing facility, uh, facility downtown. The venue was the California Club, which in L.A., you never find uh, venues like this. It had the 30-foot ceilings. It was probably built in the early 20s. It was that great classic thing. So when you think about something really surreal and out there in this very conservative private club, it was a great combination of elements. So... Then, like a painter would, you know, create his canvas, I started thinking about this of what different elements do I want to incorporate. And I approach events very much like a painting. 
it becomes a layered type of growing experience. So the first piece that we did was, okay, we'll do the dinner, two long tables. I loved Fornicetti plates. I showed it to the client. She loved them. So each guest were seated. There was a great Fornicetti plate in front of them on a poodle charger that we made that had everybody's name embroidered on it. Well, explain what a poodle charger, and we're looking at it now, so if you can sort of, we're on radio. Think of this, so uh, a furry, fake poodle fur, round disc that had everybody's name embroidered in gold on it. That's the nameplate, basically. That, that's they, they the place seating. The first um, names only, by the yes, way. Yes, first names only because we did, we did symbols so we had these long tables. We didn't want to do n- table numbers. We didn't want to do... So we came up with symbols like a car from the 50s, a cigar, uh, the melted clock, all surrealist so symbols. So you're at that part of the table so, so you know where you're So you sitting. knew what was... And that was worked into the centerpieces at the table that Celio did from Celio Floral Design. Once they got there and be- we took all of his old cigar boxes... And that became a whole installation that had the person's name on it. So on the cigar box was sitting your symbol in cocktails. You get your symbol. And then when you walked into this, you're transformed as you walked into this dinner. You saw the big symbols. And that's where you knew where to sit. So we found the Fornicetti plates because it was very much inspired by Dolly, a lot of the Fornicetti things. And then slowly but surely, you know, and I, I you know, always remembered something called ballet service. I always thought it was called French service, but it's actually called ballet service, where you have, let's say, at a table of 80, we had 40 waiters come out, all synchronized, all choreographed, and each course was done as a different movement. So, so all of the waiters came out. So how many waiters did you have? We had 40. 40 and, they, and they served two people at a time. At a time, okay. So we did one table, and then they went back and did the second table. So each course had its own story to it. So that really became... Oh, wait, go through the course. Because I'm the looking at the napkins. It. Yes. And the napkins have the the, the story, the on, story on them. Yes. So read one of the stories so, of one of the courses. For sure. So the first course was called Country Cantata. And what it was, and the storyline was, once a hen fell in love with a sturgeon. And it was potato mousseline with egg curd creme fraiche and caviar in an eggshell in a nest. So the waiters came out wearing farmer's hats, all synchronized. The music we had playing was uh, Appalachian Spring from Aaron Copeland. So all the, the, the entertainment, the big video LED displays, the waiters, the courses was one choreographed moment. So each course was done that way. My favorite, I think, was the second course, which was called Nautical New Wave. So it was a lobster salad served in a watermelon with a handle, asparagus handle. And I worked with Kai Loback to come up with the menu because we knew that the menu had to be, they weren't really foodies, the client, but we knew it had to be really remarkable presentations. Every aspect had to be surreal in some way. And the, 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 the kind of tagline was expect the unexpected, right? So Nautical New Wave was the second course with the lobster dish. We had this opera female impersonator, Prince Poppycock is his name. I think he was on America's Got Talent. He sang a song from the HMS Pinafore. And then after the course was served, a whole string of rockets came out dressed as lobsters doing a rockette version of Rock Lobster. So that's where the titles of Nautical New Wave came from. So each course was, of course kind was of integrated like, with the entertainment, with exactly. the video, with everything. What did the people experience of this feel like? Yes. So every step along the way, and even in cocktails, we set the scene. So each one was choreographed a little bit differently. So in cocktails, some of the installations we had was a wall of hands that had pasta hanging on it that had little spoons of pasta. We had a whole installation of rubber chickens over deviled eggs. So every element was an opportunity to look to wonder, to say, wow, it wasn't, it wasn't so much about being extravagant. It was really about the visual sensations every step of the way between the music, the visuals, the camaraderie of the guests. What was the look on the faces of the attendees? A lot of jaw dropping. Yeah. And it was very careful because we wanted to make sure that it wasn't too much sensory overload, but just the right mix because we didn't want people to I don't like dinners where you have to stop eating and look, you know, at entertainment. It really, and well choreographed 
from an experiential standpoint. Where do you put, now one of the things I'm learning a lot about in terms of uh, experiential design is where's the prosaic part, the part that was the let the up and the down? Was it during the eating piece? So I think it was fairly consistent, but what we did was we created transitions based on style. So at the beginning in the cocktails, the music that I selected was very much like French music from Fellini movies, music from kind of French 1950s kind of stuff, right? Classical music in the very, very beginning. So each one progressed, each one progressed. And so it gave you a little bit of a, a breathing room between yeah, the breathing, one, that's the, yeah, that's the breathing of, room. Yeah. It's kind of the, the little, I forget what you call it, in between courses that yeah. you taste, you know, yeah, just yeah. to kind of clean the palate. Yeah. So we had to do that from a sensory perspective. So the transitions also physically in the decor, going through a tunnel, transitioning that way. The tunnel went from cocktails into the dining room. Okay. So it gave people moments to recover, to reflect, and then be prepared with anticipation of the next part of the evening. So they do course two. So we okay. had entertainment pieces, like the, right. or the third course was called Birthday Bolero, based on a bowler hat. So we had the waiters come out in lab coats wearing bowler hats. It was a little like Clockwork Orange in a way. Great music. And the music progressed throughout the evening into a little bit more hipper music, because then there was followed by an after party. But getting back to the third course... I happen to know a yodeler and the client's wife is part German. So we brought in a yodeler to sing happy birthday. So it was all random acts, but it all worked together because they were all random. With the food and with the, the food. decor and everything. And the last defining moment after the yodeler sang happy birthday. So now the third course was completed. The waiters were back in position and they all had confetti cannons. And on cue, it all went like clockwork at the very end with this celebration of confetti. And that was the signal to now move to the third floor of the venue to get people dancing for the after party. So what was the moment where you felt the hosts talking about what was going on? But was it birthday? So after the after party, she gave some remarks. So nothing, there was no talking, no group talking until talking after. No speeches, no anything. It was pure enjoyment, pure experience. Even the things that we use to present the meals with. So the last course, we took colanders. We, we painted them gold, and those became the cloches that were lifted off. So each course had a, an action to it when the waiters put it down. And with the dolly humor. And, and, and with the dolly humor and, and just the surrealist aspect of it. And each of the dishes were... Dish, the, the, the actual tableware was different for each of those things. So... There was no detail left undone. Don't forget to register for BizBash Live Florida, the pop-up. Join fellow event pros February 19th and 20th in Kissimmee for this all-new experience. It won't be the same without you. Secure your spot today at bizbashlive.com forward slash Florida. I fortunately was there as a guest, and I have to say it's probably the first time I've done a project where I had no regrets. I didn't say, oh, I wish, I, you know, in, in hindsight, I wish we would have done that. I was operating 24-7 purely on fumes and adrenaline during this whole planning process. So how, so. Do you, how, do, how, do, how does an event person, an event organizer turn it off to be the guest in the middle of the event that they're organizing. So I was really, really out. smart and it came out of need and necessity. <laughs> I brought in my dear friend, Matthew David Hopkins from New York to really execute the entire production. He knows me better than pretty much anyone. So, and, and because of our loving friendship, he really wanted me to enjoy the evening. So he took care of all the choreography, the line producing, all of that to make sure that it all went impeccably well. So, okay. Then they've left the, they've left, they've gone to the third floor. So then we had the challenge of getting 160 guests from the first floor to the third floor in this very old building that had two elevators that took, you know, basically five minutes to go up the floors, but we had all of the entertainers who were part of the dinner. We had them have the uh, directional signs that, that they use at the airports to bring in the planes to get 
everybody from downstairs to upstairs. We had flashers with lobsters hanging in their crotches, which were really kind of fun flashing the guests. So we had a lot of activity getting people up the stairs ready for dancing. And that's when Christina, the, the guest of honor's wife, made all our opening remarks and things like that. We did one magic trick that was really amazing. I brought in this incredible illusionist and working behind the scenes, I can't give away too much, but he was talking about the power of connection. And that really kind of also coalesced this whole evening. It was really about the connection of love that everybody had for Tim. And at a single moment, everybody's phone in the party rang. And it was a message from Tim. And it was just fantastic to have that one moment of connectedness. So I think that's another part of our signature style is this feeling of connectedness. When you talk about gatherings, when you talk about life being better together, it really has to feel a sense of connectedness and and unity. I don't care what kind of event it is, but there's always opportunities. There's always opportunities to to build in some connected moment. So what happened after the the phone rang? So after the phone rang, we brought out the cake, the dessert, the dancing started, everything happening. One of the fun things about the after party, we did this LED dance floor that was just incredible. What was incredible about it? Because we created imagery. So people were actually dancing on a huge LED string, not with just lights flashing, but with movies going on, with visuals going on that were all very surrealist kinds of things. So it it took just the element of dancing and brought one other element into it, which was a visual aspect. We had dancers that wore, wore disco balls as their heads. So it just became this multi-sensory thing every step of the way. One of my favorite parts of the after party was just for no reason, I had four nuns sitting in the library smoking cigars, playing poker throughout the evening. That was all that they were doing. The photo booth that we created was a really great experience. It's a little hard to describe, but Dolly back in the 30s created, it's now a famous sofa that looks like a pair of lips. So we created the lips. We brought in that sofa, had two paintings of the guest of honor's eyes with cigar eyelashes. So people were actually in this staged environment for the photo booth. And that was incredible. We created the same gold gilded frames that the invitation came in so that they got their framed picture. But downstairs was on a library wall. We had French maids. We had French maids giving out the the final thing before they left. So did the did the guests, I mean, you know, when we go as an event people, we go to an event, everybody pulls out their cameras and start shooting pictures. Did these people shoot pictures or did they feel intimidated that they couldn't? No, I, you know, it's an interesting question. We, you know, the client knew that we couldn't say no, but I think a lot of people took pictures, but it was a little bit of an older crowd too. So it wasn't necessarily a social media crowd right. per se, right. but certainly a lot of pictures were taken. A lot of moments were captured. We did a movie of, of the whole event, which was really, really wonderful. Not just the making of, but really to capture all of these things that we're right. talking about visually. Let's go back to the invitation. Now, yes. now you got a sense of what this event was. Before yes. the, they sort of got this <clears throat> sense of, oh my, holy shit, what is this I'm going to? <laughs> so for over 20 years, you've known me and we've always talked about, and it's a little cliche at this point, but back in the day, you know, the invitation is the keepsake that sets the tone. Right. That raises the bar. And what we did for this one was... It brought back a lot of the things that I did from my past with the hand painting, but it took it to a whole nother level. So we created an illustration of the guest of honor, hand painted illustration of him as Dolly. And we put it in a gilded frame. It came in a gorgeous acrylic matte, black, black matte acrylic box with the droopy 60, you know, inspired by Dolly. And each painting was hand signed. It had the brass plaque on it from the private collection of who the guest was. So they felt very, very, the personalization aspect. And we've always believed very strongly in personalization because that's what we found. And especially in the digital age, even though a digital invitation might have your name on it, it doesn't always feel personal. In this particular case, the tactileness, the fact that it was hand-painted, the fact that it was signed, the fact that... It had a brass plaque with your name etched into it. You knew it wasn't done at Kinko's, right? Right. right. And 
And the response that she started getting right from the invitation and people sending in pictures of where they've put the frame painting set the whole party but you going. Have, you, you have to. The... You cannot cheap out on the party if you send an invitation like that. No, and it puts so much pressure. And <laughs> to be 100% honest, I didn't know what the party was going to be in its entirety when that invitation went out. Right. And that that could drive any party planner or every, any producer crazy because when you're dealing with this from an artistic perspective, it's never done until it's right. done. So when does an invitation for a party like that go out? How many... Uh, four weeks? So we sent out the invitations in July for a September event. Oh, so this is a long term. Yeah. So, you know, in the event planning, just to kind of give you a sense, it took us about a, sev- a good seven months to plan everything. I brought furniture in from Italy. There's a famous uh, photographer named Maurizio Catalan you may be familiar with. He did the banana with the masking tape that got a lot of press at Basel recently. Mm-hmm. So there's a company that licensed some of his outrageous photographs that were created into furniture and rugs. Uh, So the third act was still a surrealist thing, but it was very modern. So we went from very classic to very open, opulent and lush to a very outrageous modern surrealism for the after party. So every aspect of that had to be done. And the client really didn't have a vision for what this ultimately was going to be. She had incredible trust. I was able to understand her likes and dislikes to be able to arbitrate a lot of the decisions that were being made. But there was also a lot of nervousness because of having that trust. You know, it seems to me, and I want to see if you agree with this premise, is that the great events of today, of, of now, whether you're doing a conference or whether you're doing a marketing thing, it's really about performance art. I mean, this is, we're in this era of performance art is what people will really remember. You're really in the curating in a way. And I'm glad you brought that up because we're also living in an age where we went from, some people called it the digital age, some people called it the information age. I believe now we're entering into an age which I like to think of as the embodiment age. Because with all of these things that have been going on, We're now out of the information and now we're into that emotional body. How are we making people feel? And that really is how I think we have to think about everything these days. Yeah, I mean, we're also, you know, the buzzword, another buzzword that's been going on for a long time is that we're in the transformational era. And I think those two things work together. Because if people don't get in touch with their emotions, there's never going to be transformation. Right. And, you know, there's this famous quote, and I use this in one of my talks, I think, therefore I am. Well, we have a different perspective. I feel, therefore I think. Because so many decisions we now know are made by how someone feels. Whether it's who you're voting for, whether it's the products that you buy, whether it's who you like on social media, it's all based on how you feel. And that's what's triggering people's reactions. So it ties those two things together, transformation and embodiment. Because you can't have one without the other. You can't have a transformation without having a a, a more developed emotional body. Well, also also in our world, raising the bar of it makes you feel more. I mean, you basically took, in another part of your career, you basically took an envelope and made it into an icon. And made it into an experience. And made it into an experience. So tell us about that. I'm very fortunate because in my field, if you really think back, invitations, greeting cards. It was always on the fourth floor of the department store next to the restrooms or the credit department. There was, it was always ink on paper. There was never really emotion to it. So taking that core thing and, and saying, well, it doesn't have to be that way. Wedding invitations don't have to be black engraving on an ecru card. That was always what was thought of this category. So to be able to Make it a mixed media thing to make it a piece of art, communication art. That's why we call what we do luxury communications, because it evokes feeling. They are meticulously handcrafted, no matter how simple or elaborate they are. We use interesting materials, so we bring in the the neuroscience of touch. And it's the collection of all of those things that creates this imprint. So when it came to the Oscars, it was our 25th anniversary. I was thinking, what would be the dream come true? 
And in my category, there's not that many moments that feature an, an envelope or a piece of stationery except the Oscars. The two most famous phrases are the Oscar goes to and the envelope please. Well, they had the statuette, but the envelopes that were being used were like those envelopes you get at Staples that have the silver liner in it. They didn't it. even and think that They didn't even it. think that that could even be yeah. an iconic keepsake. And David, what it really points out, it doesn't matter how little technology you have in something. So take the envelope in the winner's card. With the least amount of technology, I know that 50 years from now, somebody opens up that envelope, they will be transported back to that exact moment, that pin-dropping moment, where they were acknowledged and recognized for their artistic accomplishment. A moment in their life. A moment in your lives. Right. And that's where we really came up with the tagline of Mark the Moment, mm -hmm. because all of these things are series of a moment, a series of moments that is what really defines someone's life or a company's history, whether it's a you know anniversary celebration or even a, a nonprofit gala, well, you know they all become these emotional moments, and especially with nonprofits, with all the competition well, for dollars. Yes, yeah. Well, also it, it sort of connects to the idea that you this need that emotional performance heart art. What does art do to you? It creates emotional moments. Yes, and memories. And memories, exactly. exactly. And when they become personalized when they become not formulaic, when they become individual. Our goal is always to have guests leaving, telling stories about the event. Oh, absolutely. Right? And not the disaster stories. And not the disaster <laughs> if stories. If you can help it. Not about waiting how long it takes to get valet. Because that's the first thing they will you know, say. Not to complain about how... And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because what we learned in a luxury business is, let's say you book a five-star hotel vacation and it's impeccable in Italy and, you know, uh, Hotel du Cap, for example, and you have an incredible five days and you're checking out and the person at the desk screws your checkout out, that last memory is the one that you're going to remember. So it's funny, Richard Adius, who, who ran World Economic Forum, which is actually going mm -hmm. on right now, talks about how you can have the best event in the world, but if they screw up the transportation, yes. the whole, your whole thing goes out the window. And that becomes the memory. That becomes the memory. So there requires thought. You can't do it with hoping and wishing. Right. It has to be creatively, you know, we used to say, you know, think outside the box. We used to say there is no box. So, and again, it could just be the simplest idea that when it's turned on its head becomes a whole different experience. If you notice in my office, I have a garbage pail with crumpled paper. People say, is that real or is that just a piece of art? It's just a plain paper basket, waste basket that has crumpled paper in it, but it looks great, right? So it's taking simple things and looking at them differently. Yep, yep. Uh, why don't we end on your friend, Darren Starr, sure. who did his uh, one of his birthdays. Yeah. Darren is known for 90210 and Younger, and he's like one of the superstars. Melrose Place, Melrose Place. And Sex in the City. Sex in the City, right? So, so you're so, storytelling so for him. Darren. So Yes, so so I'm storytelling for him. Darren was having his 50th birthday. You know, it was going to be a surprise party. His partner at the time blew the surprise, which to the host of the party is the worst thing you can do. So he came up with the idea, let's make this a reverse surprise party, right? So all the guests still knew that it was going to be a surprise party, but they didn't know that the surprise was going to be on them. So the way we were able to orchestrate this is we had Darren dressed in a, a fat suit and he became one of the waiters and one of those annoying waiters. So we staged him pushing somebody into the pool. We staged him like you know, holding the tray up too high so people couldn't get the food, right? And all the while, the guests were there waiting for Darren to arrive. So they were in a complete other world. They didn't even notice. Then he wound up going up to the singer who was singing during cocktails, started dancing with her, and slowly but surely took off one layer at a time, turned around, and yelled surprise. People were blown away. That's funny. That's so and funny. so that creates one of those moments yeah, yeah. that is personal, that creates storytelling yep. that for however long people remember that party will have that one moment. And you mentioned earlier, that's like remembering your first job. Yep. These are all of those same yep. types of moments. Yep. yep. And you did it for one of the best storytellers in the world. In the world, <laughs> right. And got him to go along with it, which is even better. So. so, Mark, if somebody wants to experience a little bit of your genius, how do they get in touch with you? Well, first of all, our website, Mark Friedland, M-A-R-C, 
F-R-I-E-D-L-A-N-D.com. They see a lot of our work. We're very accessible. We love to do this regardless of budget. You know, it doesn't have to be multi-million dollars. It, somebody just has to have the currency of willingness. and The currency and the courage. And the courage, yes, to, to do something different. Yeah. That's a great place to end. Yes. Thanks, Well, Mark. thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, we're back. David, I really like the idea that Mark had of return on joy at social events as the counterpart to return on investment for corporate. Uh, you could probably develop some metrics around that uh, or maybe some qualitative rubrics. You may not be able to do it at Harvard Business School, <laughs> but in our world, you probably could. Right. Uh, people operating at this level understand um, intuitively what I pulled out as his four S's, the storytelling, the senses, sensibility, and style. Uh, and now I really want to experience a Rockettes version of Rock Lobster. These details were really a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I, I, this was really well thought out. The 60th birthday party was, uh, one, when I heard, he called me on the phone and he told me about this event. And I thought, oh, okay, yeah, 60th birthday party. But then when the details sort of came out and he really showed how he was so thoughtful about everything that, that, that he did, I thought it would be good to share with our audience uh, just to show that we're really in a substantive business <laughs> and people have this perception that it's just all fluff, but everything is thought out and the whole world is following the way we are looking at experiences everywhere. Yeah. These are the, the trendsetters, right? Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, it's thoughtful, it's strategic and you can apply it to, to social, to nonprofit and exactly. corporate. Exactly. So Beth, what else is going on at BizBash? I wanted to alert everybody to look out for our coverage of the South Beach Wine and Food Festival, one of our favorite times of the year. It's the the top food industry event, according to BizBash's top 100 events in the United States. And we have on the ground coverage from our longtime correspondent, Tracy Block, who got to taste her way through the festival. It's such a tough job. Right. Somebody has to do it, David. Somebody has to do it. Uh, so with that said, uh, we are going to thank all the people that worked on this podcast, uh, Claire Hoffman, who handles all of our editorial duties. Uh, Rebecca Pappas, who is responsible for getting it out. And we also want to thank Dave Nelson of The Lens Group for being our producer. What do we say, Beth? Gather on. Gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on. <laughs>